Hey guys, it's your favorite reliability test guy here with another fun-filled, action-packed video on reliability tests and validation topics. This current video is an introduction to vibration and shock test controllers, how to select and operate and set up a vibration and shock test controller. I hope you enjoy this video, and if you do, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching, and let's get started. In this video, we will define definitions, vibe and shock controller features and specs, setup and post data tips. So what is a vibration and shock test controller? A vibration and shock test controller is used to produce simulations of environmental and system generated vibration and shock excitations. As I discussed in part one of my two part series on vibration testing and application and theory, you can think of the controller as part music player and part your brain and also your hands. The vibration test amplifier you can think of as a stereo amplifier, and the vibration test system as a giant loudspeaker, which has similar components such as a field coil and an armature. The accelerometer can be thought of as your ears and senses the music. The test controller for vibration testing uses a closed loop strategy that uses feedback to make adjustments to the output signal from the vibration test controller to the amplifier and ultimately convert it to mechanical energy and movement on the vibration test system. In other words, a closed loop system uses feedback to make adjustments to the output signal as displayed. Here we see a vibration and shock test controller, an amplifier, a vibration test system, and an accelerometer. The signal is outputted from the vibration test controller based on your profile. The amplifier amplifies the signal and the vibration test system produces a mechanical output based on the electrical input signal, just like your stereo system. To quickly simplify this, in layman's or lame woman's terms, you start some music on your iPhone that is connected to a stereo amplifier. The stereo amplifier amplifies the music signal and the music signal is sent to your speaker which is mechanically reproduces the music signal by changing the air pressure at the speaker and transmitting music through the air in the form of vibration across air molecules that reach your ear and stimulate your eardrums, which your brain interprets as sound. Let's say you start up some music on your iPhone and you realize that the music is too quiet and you turn up the volume on your iPhone. You then realize the sound is too loud and turn down the volume a little bit. Your brain and personal preferences are now telling you that the output sound is perfect and you can enjoy your tunes or your jams. Let's go ahead and cover some vibration shock controller features and specs. Some major features to take into consideration are the software package for the controller. So you should evaluate a controller software to ensure it has the features and operation that you are looking for. You need to understand the intention of the vibration test controller. If it's for a production environment, you do not want to get a super fancy controller with all the bells and whistles as you would see in an engineering vibration or shock test controller. For the software side, you need to also consider what types of tests you want to perform. Many Vibe controller manufacturers provide sign, random, and classical shock as part of their Vibe controller package. However, most Vibe controllers require additional payment for additional tests and features, such as shock response spectrum, sign on random, random on random, and field replication. You need to know what tests you will need to perform when purchasing a controller and purchasing additional software features and vibration and shock test capabilities. However, most of these controllers can be upgraded at a later date if you need to run a new type of test for shock or vibration testing. So I recommend getting the bare minimum of what you need for testing and upgrade for additional tests and features as needed at a later date. On the hardware side, you need to determine your channel count or the maximum number of accelerometers you will use for testing on a given vibration test. For a higher accelerometer channel count requirements, I recommend avoiding vibration control hardware that has only four channels. Most of these controllers can be attached over Ethernet or some other connection strategy to expand channel capabilities. However, do you really want to have a bunch of additional Vibe controller boxes taking up space in your test lab? I don't think so. In a single vibration controller box, I have seen four channel control boxes, eight channel, 16 channel, and there are rack mounted solutions as well that allow you to add additional channels to a single large rack mounted box. I've seen these with channel expansion capabilities 
that go up to 64 channels and even hundreds of channels for accelerometers. The accelerometer inputs on a vibration controller usually have a female BNC. You can purchase accelerometer cables that have a BNC mill connector on one end, or you can purchase an adapter that goes from 1032 accelerometer connectors to male BNC. Most current vibe controllers have a built-in integrated circuit piezoelectric power supply or ICP power supply for voltage mode accelerometers. I discuss voltage and charge mode accelerometers in more detail in my part 1 video on vibration testing application and theory. Time for a tip! that you will not learn anywhere else, especially in a vibration and shock test controller manufacturer's training course. So pay attention and stop tweeting about how awesome my videos are for just a second. If you are running a long run of BNC or accelerometer cable, I am talking about more than 50 feet, the ICP power supply that is built into most vibe and shock controllers is insufficient for long distance cable runs. What you will find out, especially if you put your vibe controller in a separate control room, is that you will pick up a tremendous amount of noise and you can get a vibe controller abort message in some cases. If you are using a voltage mode accelerometer, you will need to purchase a separate power supply signal conditioner to overcome the voltage drop and clean up the signal. Also, make sure you are using high quality, well shielded BNC cables, especially for the long run of 50 plus feet. You can also pick up a noise through the BNC cable itself, so don't get cheap on your cabling or you will pay the price. The connection between the drive signal output on the controller and the input to the shaker amplifier is also a BNC. So same rule applies. Make sure you use a high quality shielded cable or you can have noise issues and test supports can occur. Let's go ahead and cover setup of a vibration controller for a test. There are a ton of features on many current controllers and we are only going to cover the ones that are most beneficial for getting you up to speed and running. We will only be covering random vibration setup in detail for this video. Here are some of the major options and setup menus that you will find on most five controllers. We have the shaker parameters menu, the test profile menu, the accelerometer setup menu, the test control setup menu, and the signal setup menu. Let's cover each of these menus and some of the key fields you will need to update for your test and vibration test system. Now each of these menus could be in a completely different location of your test controller software, or as I've seen on some controller menus, tabs under a single pop-up menu, which is nice. Let's take a look at shaker parameters. The shaker parameter menu is where you configure the limits for your vibration test system. Many controllers have preset limits for various types of vibration test systems. It is as simple as selecting your shaker make and model and selecting vertical or horizontal configurations. If your shaker is not a preset limit in the controller you own, you will need to enter the parameters manually. Refer to your shaker or vibration test systems manual for the armature weight, drive cone weight, slip table weight, and head expander weight, along with the shaker's displacement limit, sine acceleration and velocity limit, random acceleration and velocity limit, and your shock acceleration limit. If your shaker is a preset in your vibration controller, the only items you will need to update are your test fixture weight and your test unit's weight. If your shaker is a preset in your vibe controller, the only items you will need to update are your test fixture weight and your test unit's weight. Sometimes there will only be a field for the test unit weight. As you might have guessed, you will need to add your fixture and test unit weights together and enter that value in the test unit weight field. Let's go ahead and cover the test profile menu now. The test profile menu has a breakpoint table similar to what we reviewed earlier in this video. However, notice there are a few more columns including slope, minimum tolerance or limit, could also be a nomenclature used, the maximum tolerance or limit, the minimum abort, and the maximum abort. In your test profile menu, you can either enter the slopes and frequencies, which will auto-calculate your acceleration at a given frequency, or enter your acceleration and frequency and the controller will auto-calculate the slope. You typically don't have to enter both values manually. 
The tolerance or limits for min and max are your test tolerances for your control line. Depending on your specs or requirements for your system or product, a deviation of a control line will result in a failed test. But depending on your product, you may not care about this limit. The abort limits, on the other hand, are something everyone should care about. Typically, these are set to negative 6 dB and 6 dB respectively, and you should leave these alone unless there is some super rare case that, you, that requires you to change these values. The abort limits are there to protect your system or product if you have a setup issue that could cause acceleration levels to run much higher, so do not mess around with these values unless you need to and know what you're doing. Let's take a look at the accelerometer channel setup menu now. The key items you will see in the channel setup menu are the channel type, sensitivity, channel coupling, max voltage, channel ID, channel location, and the signal measurement type. Sometimes you will see a TEDS option as well. TEDS stands for Transducer Electronic Data Sheet. And if you have a TEDS accelerometer, you can simply click this option to input most of the fields based on the stored data within the accelerometer itself. Let's go ahead and review each of the fields just discussed. The channel type column determines whether that channel will be used for control, which is the feedback that your vibration controller uses to determine the future output for the drive signal, to adjust and maintain the control of your shaker to your test profile parameters. Another channel type is the monitor or response. This is the accelerometer that you have attached to your test unit and it is simply monitoring the response acceleration at the location on your test unit. The last channel type will be disabled. This simply means you are not using this channel and want to disable it from being displayed as a monitor channel on your graph or as a control for your feedback loop. The next parameter is your sensitivity. This value can be found on your voltage mode accelerometer's box. Check your calibration data as well on your accelerometer to make sure you are not using a sensor that is out of calibration. Don't do that. Next channel column is the max voltage. The max voltage can be found on your accelerometer manufacturer's data sheet. This is the maximum voltage range for your accelerometer. The next column in this example is the channel ID. My personal preference is to enter the serial number of that particular sensor and the axis it is mounted in. Next up is the location ID. In this column, you will enter the location where your accelerometer is mounted. This could be on the fixture, on the top cover of your unit, and so forth. The last column is the measurement types field. This is where you select what you are measuring, such as acceleration, velocity, and even pressure or temperature on some controllers. In this case, we're using accelerometers, so we will select acceleration. On to the next menu, test control setup menu. The key fields you will see in the menu are control strategy, lines or control resolution, sigma clipping, drive voltage limit, pre-test settings, and in this example, I'm throwing in test schedule as well. But on many controllers, you will see the test schedule under its own independent menu. So refer to your controller's man manual for where your test schedule is located. The control strategy option are typically single channel, weighted average, maximum, and minimum. Single channel, as you might have guessed, is the option to select if you are only using one control accelerometer. Weighted average is a averaged weighted algorithm based on the feedback signal from each accelerometer to determine adjustments that need to be made to the drive output signal to maintain control to your test profile requirements. Max and min control strategies will use the maximum and minimum values for all of your control signals to produce the future drive output signal. Next up is lines or control lines, or lines of resolution. This determines the number of points or frequency bands for your controller, which it will use to compute the next drive signal output. The higher the number, the more control you will have following to your test profile values, as the number of points factored are higher. 
However, this is also slows down the response time of your controller, and you may not see a test issue in your control line until it is too late. So keep that in mind and only use the maximum lines required to keep your test control within tolerance of your test profile. Likewise, the lower the control number, the less points or frequency bands are used for control. This speeds up your control response time, but setting this value too low may cause your drive output to not follow your test profile adequately and could lead to an out of tolerance or even abort limit issue. Next up is Sigma Clipping. Sigma Clipping prevents large acceleration spikes during a random vibration test. Setting this value too high can damage your system or product if a large spike occurs, and setting your Sigma Clipping too low will cause the drive signal to no longer be a close approximation of a random signal. So you will need to balance between removing dangerous random spikes and not overclipping your signal to the point it loses its randomness, for a lack of better words. Next up is the drive voltage limit. This is another way to protect your product and your shaker. Set the voltage only as high as it needs to be to run the test, even if your vibration test system is capable of running a max drive signal, for instance 10 volts, from your vibration controller, it doesn't mean you should set every single test to 10 volts. So don't be an idiot or you can break your test unit and possibly damage your shaker. Next are the pretest settings. Sometimes you will see an option to enable or disable the pretest settings. You want to have this setting enabled to catch your boneheaded mistakes like forgetting to attach your control accelerometer, torque your vibration fixture bolts, torque your bull nose or drive cone bolts, and so forth. Two of the common pretest settings are your decibel ramp schedule, which is, lets your shaker run at a negative dB level from your test profile and it slowly lets it ramp up to ensure that there are no issues with your test control strategy or your test setup. It can also be in a percentage of your test profile levels as well and not necessarily decibels. And last but not least is your test profile schedule. In some vibration controllers, this is also where you will put in your pre-test or ramp up schedule as well. In this menu, you will put the duration of your test or test time most vibration controllers today also have an option such as saving all signal displayed on your graph, screenshots of your graph or graphs, and auto-generating your test reports. So you can also include these and many vibe controllers into your test schedule. You'll also, along with your pretest, you will want to add some ramps at percentages until you get to 100% or the full level of your test profile just to gradually ramp up the shaker and not hit the shaker with 100% drive right when you click start on your controller. So keep that in mind as well when you set up your test schedule. I mentioned test reports just now, but for time's sake, we will not cover test reports in this video. But many controllers let you customize your test report content and layout. So refer to your test controllers manual and features to see what you can change and, and update and customize for your application. And for the final menu, let's cover signal setup real quick. And this is where you select which signals you will want to display on your graph. A lot of controllers will have additional signals you can configure such as plot in the Q factor real time, tracking resonant frequencies and responses real time, and math signals real time, where you can perform your own equations based on what data you are trying to display on your graph. Like I said, there are tons of other features that Vibe controllers have, such as test report setup and setting up your test graph, such as scaling, graph color, and signal colors. But I don't want to make a two hour video that you will never finish watching. So refer to your vibration test controllers manual. Let's cover some post data tips really quick. If this is an engineering test and you're using response accelerometers on your test unit, many vibration test controllers have post data processing options. We will cover a couple in this video. It is important to highlight important features or data in your test results so that the mechanical and structural engineers can assess their design and performance against the vibration test requirements. Some controllers have a menu where you can auto detect your resonant peaks while other controllers, especially older ones, will require you to manually select your resonant frequencies. 
You can select these resonant frequencies or res resonant peaks and auto-calculate results such as your resonance amplitude and frequency, your transmissibility at the resonance, and your Q factor. Amplitude and frequency are pretty straightforward. That is simply the peak acceleration of your resonance and the frequency at which the peak acceleration occurs. Transmissibility is the ratio of the acceleration of response from your test profile and your test profile input acceleration. Q factor is the frequency at the peak of your resonance divided by the delta of the left and right half power or negative 3 dB frequencies. And that's it folks! Some key takeaways to consider are determine your requirements for hardware and software when purchasing a vibration and shock test controller and make sure to set up the key parameters and fields we just discussed. And leave the ones that you don't understand as default or ask a more experienced engineer or you can even reach out to me at one of the links below. I've used virtually every vibration and shock test controller on the market today. So if you need some hands-on training, reach out to me at one of the links below to see how I can help. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching and enjoy the rest of your day.